Today, Darren, I want to do something a little bit different. I want to start this episode with a game, kind of like a, a little name that flip kind of game, if you will. Um, this game I call Fisher Stevens or Stephen Fisher. And what I'm going to do is just read a line from uh, one of these actors from one of their movies, and you're going to tell me which actor it is, if it's Stephen Fisher or Fisher Stevens. So get, just to, to just to <laughs> remind audiences or help them our audience, what uh, what movies would, would Stephen Fisher be from? I, I think this is coming from the the fact that Fisher Stevens, his name is actually Stephen Fisher, and then when he was trying to like when he was becoming famous, he found oh there's already somebody named Stephen Fisher, so he changed his name to Fisher Stevens. I think that's where it came from. Well, <laughs> there are a few uh, Stephen Fishers out there. There's more than one, uh, right. but the Stephen Fisher we're talking about is the one that spells with a PH. S T E P H E N. So, okay. and then Fisher Stevens is with a V. Okay. So yeah. Stephen Fisher, I think he was in Hellboy. Was that one like a he's a minor player? Okay. All right. So what what exactly what game are we playing? That's that's fun. I like this idea. You're just gonna you're just gonna tell me which actor it is. Which okay. I'm gonna read the line, but I'm gonna read it kind of monotone, so you can't tell like uh, who it is. I'm not gonna read it any kind of inflection. No, no, you know. Indian accent as a giveaway. <laughs> so I'm just going to do the line very monotone. I'm just going to read it and you tell me who it is. No Bonus Indian point. accent. That's, that's probably for the best. I think <laughs> we can avoid that. Okay. Bonus points for which movie it is from. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. Fisher Stevens or Stephen Fisher. First line. I am sick of wearing the dress in this family. Fisher Stevens. Very good. You'll be hard to digest. Stephen Fisher? Yeah, good, good. Okay. I'm thinking she is a virgin, or at least she used to be. Again, it would be more familiar if it was in that Indian accent. Fisher Stevens. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think you'll find the view over here rather spectacular. Stephen Fisher? Yeah. <laughs> I'm cool. You're cool. We're cool. Thank you. Good night. Uh, Fisher Stevens. Yeah, Fisher Stevens. Okay. Which movie? Which movie oh. was that one from? Uh, uh, <laughs> the, other, the first two for, for Fisher Stevens were short circuit because they sounded really like not, not right. That yeah. one, I don't know. What, what would it be from? My Science Project. My Science. The, the other one where he used the, where he flipped somebody off. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> okay, um, last one. Did she stick her tongue down your throat? That's Fisher Stevens from Short Circuit. Good job. You got them all right. <laughs> right. Well, a lot of the Fisher Stevens ones, again, like I said, like it has that, the accent. Like I could hear the accent in my head. So Yeah, and there would be a dead giveaway. But obviously, you know, he's really only famous for Short Circuit and Short Circuit 2. <laughs> and <laughs> and movies, dating but... Michelle Pfeiffer, I think he was famous for that. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, right, right. However, I did hear he was going to be in, he was offered a role in Friends. He was offered uh, the part of Ross, I think, and he okay. turned it down. Well, he, he showed up. I think he did show up in Friends, too. He played like one of, one of Phoebe's boyfriends. He was like really hoity-toity, and they all hated him. Yeah, but he was originally offered the part of Ross, I think, and he turned it down. So. <laughs> yeah, well, he probably, if he was Ross, he probably would have had more inflections in his voice than David Schwimmer, yeah. so maybe <laughs> I mean, that's why they didn't want him. All right. Well, uh, do you want to get down to it and get started on this episode? Talking yeah. about short circuit. Yeah, that'd be great. Let's let's get right down to the let's get right down to the the casual racism of <laughs> short circuit. That sounds great. Welcome back to Nostalgia Cast. I'm Johnny Craddock. And I'm Darren Lumbert. And uh, today's episode is going to be about Short Circuit 1986. But real quick before that, let's recap last week's, or last last episodes, I guess, wasn't last week. But uh, we did talk with uh, a good friend of ours, Jason Payne. We had him on the show. And uh, he chose the movie Never Ending Story. And um, Darren, real quick, what do we think about that one? 
Well, it was the latest in a long line of, of travel fantasy movies. We did Wiz, uh, Return to Oz the week before. We talked about Wizard of Oz. We talked about uh, Phantom Tollbooth. We covered that in one week. We covered Labyrinth. Um, Pan's Labyrinth we talked about. There's just a whole list. Last Action Hero is a movie that we brought up. There's a whole list of movies that have this same plot structure of a kid starting out normal and then he gets swept up into a magical world and then has an adventure in the magical world and then gets dropped right back into reality again. So Never Ending Story does fit that same model. Uh, and like, like we talked about, there are countless of those movies. So we all have different ones from our childhoods. I think I did have more of an attachment to Wizard of Oz. Not Wiz I keep saying Wizard of Oz. To Return to Oz than I did to Neverending Story. Um, but I did have a connection to Neverending Story because of our tax, because of a Bastion actually being the hero of his own story that he's reading. So we can't, I at least came down on, it's worth remembering because it's one of these travel fantasy movies that works magically when you're a kid. It doesn't work so much when you're an adult, but you can show it to a kid today, like you talked about, your son was inspired to get up and get moving and, and to be active. And that is important. Even though it's a movie that, you know, like I talked about, Pan's Labyrinth is a better version of the story, one that I would latch onto and I would watch again. But I don't want to take away from the importance that Never Ending Story had on me as a child, has on your kids, has on my kids. It's important. I don't think that part of it, yeah, it can be remade and look better, but I don't know if the message will get across to kids as well as it already has. So that's where I came down. And I know that Jason came down. He wanted to be remade because you could do a lot of technology better. How did you fall on that? Yeah, I was torn with that one. Um, I, I latched onto it when I was a kid. And so I, I made the point that uh, as a kid, I want to see it, you know, be uh, remembered. But as an adult, I had a hard time with it. I kept finding all the faults and I kept just kind of wishing it would end. And so I, I would say it was worth a remake um, in that aspect. But uh, still overall, a pretty good movie. And uh, just real quick, real side note, when we released the episode with Jason on it, um, we actually got the most views we ever had gotten um, in like a 12 hour period than any of our previous episodes. And so I think Jason's star power kind of brought that extra, those extra views to us. So we want to thank Jason for, uh, for doing that for us. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sure that was a part of it. I, I just think his never ending story, like we talked about, has a pull, has an attraction for people that remember that movie fondly. Um, so, yeah, Jason had nothing to do with that. <laughs> as <long. laughs> Anyway, but we, we try to talk about in the show, like nostalgia is important, but it's also important not to hold on to it and make that the defining attitude that you have. But again, with never ending story, it, the lessons that it taught us as kids are important and that's that part of the nostalgia that's interesting to talk about because it's like yeah I'm nostalgic for it but is that nostalgia worth something is it worth holding on to is it worth talking about and what does it mean to me as an adult today so I think that's a another kind of spin on nostalgia cast is that it can be bad but can also be a good thing it can also help us grow as people all right well let's get into the short circuit but before we do that let's watch the trailer It's the ultimate soldier. It doesn't get happy, it doesn't get sad, it doesn't laugh at your jokes. It is quite simply Jim. the most sophisticated robot on Earth. Alec. At Nova Robotics, the future is in good hands. You're doing real good. Just keep working on those last two bars. Thanks to Dr. Newton Crosby. Originally, I designed it as a marital aid. But artificial intelligence has gotten too smart. No. It's malfunctioning. It might not do anything. But it could decide to blow away anything that moves, couldn't it? Because $11 million worth of robot just hit the road. Wow! Number five is alive. Welcome to my planet. You just have to find number five, get some answers. Why don't you come on in my house? And it's got a lot of living to do. Whatever it takes to put that stupid contraption out of commission, that's what you do. Me input. They can seem quite lifelike, but they are still machines. Oh. Number five is alive. Nice software. Uh, how it happens, who knows, but it has happened. A new comedy adventure from John Badham, the director of War Games. We're going to be after you. we got to get out of here now. Hey, he's alive. No! Ali Sheedy, Steve Gutenberg, and number five. Beautiful. Short circuit. I am alive. All right, 
right, Short Circuit, 1986, directed by John Badham. Um, do you say Badham or Badham? I, I say Badham. Badham? Okay. Yeah. And um, he's, he's well known for War Games, Saturday Night Fever. Um, he's done a few others, um, Stakeout, um, another Stakeout, movies like that. Yeah. Um, Burn War Wire, games. I think. War Games. Did you, did you mention yeah, War Games movie. already? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I said War Games. Um, uh, you know, pretty good director, I would say. Not, not, not bad. Um, uh, starring uh, Steve Gutenberg, Ali Sheedy, G.W. Bailey is in this. Austin Pendleton, um, and uh, Tim Blaney does the uh, the voice of Johnny Five, and right. of course Peter Stevens also in there as uh, Ben Jabatuya. So uh, we can talk about him. But um, real quick, I want to start with my history of this movie. And um, I saw it again when I was really young, maybe seven or eight years old. And every year in the summertime, my family would take a vacation to California. Uh, my dad grew up there, and uh, there was a couple years in my young life that I lived there, and uh, two of my sisters were born there, actually. But um, we would go back and visit Disneyland, we'd go to the beach, and we'd always visit my dad's uncle and his family. And uh, when we were there, you know, we would stay in there, and we'd sleep in their living room, and we'd watch movies, you know, at night. And uh, our first night visiting this one summer, um, they had just seen Short Circuit the night before. Um, so I'm guessing it was 1986 when we went, maybe in 87, might have been a year later, I don't know. But um, we were there, we were watching this movie, but before we watched it, uh, my, my uh, grand aunt, I guess you would call her, and my first cousins once removed, they were just like praising this movie like crazy. They were saying how great it was, how much they loved it, how funny it was, just how, how cute and charming it was. And uh, they kind of influenced my opinion. Um, me being very young, I was kind of like, I was excited to see what they were so excited about. I wanted to watch this movie and experience what they experienced. And so we watched it. And immediately I, I could say that I liked it. And I said that, you know, for a while it was my favorite movie. And I would tell people that it was my favorite movie. And so I, we got home and I, we, we bought it and we'd watch it all the time. And, um, you know, I mean, it didn't last long until something else came along. But that movie for a long time was, you know, considered one of my favorite movies. And anyway, uh, so going back to it again now, like uh, I had a kind of a hard time because I, I really, really wanted to like it again. But kind of like what happened with Never End Story, I kept seeing all the, all the like, not mistakes, but just kind of like, well, how is that possible? Well, how is that possible? Why, why, why is that like that? You know, all these different things kept popping up as I was watching it. And so it kept taking me out of the movie. Um, I was trying to enjoy it because I, I wanted to, you know, relive it again because I remember how much I liked it back then. But um, I, I was having a really hard time with it this time. Um, but anyway, um, that happens to me quite a bit sometimes, or it did back then, not so much anymore, but that my, my opinion of movies would be influenced by somebody else. And I was always kind of like, you know, I'd lean towards what someone else liked. I kind of see what they like, why they like it. And I would try to like, you know, and so that always bothered me that I would do that. And so in, you know, college years, I, I tried to steer away from that and try to just get my own opinion on things and find out what I really thought and what, I, you know, um, but anyway, thinking back about it and thinking back to that time when I first saw it, um, I don't know. It was kind of like, well, why, why did they influence me so much? I mean, why did I let them influence me so much? Why couldn't, maybe because I was younger, but why couldn't I just, just, uh, watch the movie and make up my own mind right then? You know what I mean? Why couldn't I do that? But anyway, um, I don't know. I mean, overall, I, I think it still is, is a, it's a fun movie. I mean, it's, it's meant to kind of be silly and cartoony and fun and, and uh, you know, I, I can appreciate all that. I really, I really appreciate all the the robots and the 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 mechanics and how they got the robot to work and then the interactions with the robot. I thought that was really kind of interesting how they did that. So that that was cool. Um, but like I said, it was hard for me to like to look past all the flaws and mistakes this time around. Um, but anyway, so that's my history with it. Um, so what what about you? Okay. Well, you said something interesting, you know, you talked about, and we talked about this last week with never ending story or, or last time is that as a kid, we love these movies, but as an adult, we start noticing the scenes, we start noticing the mistakes. And I think, um, now that's only natural. You know, we, we, when you're a kid and you're, you know, you're talking about being influenced when you're watching these movies, you're kind of swept up in the magic of it. You don't notice the, the technique. You don't notice the, the, the cuts and you know, the pacing. I mean, maybe you do, you know, it's hard to be a kid watching a, like Kramer versus Kramer or, or something like that, where it's, you notice that it's not hitting the beats that are keeping you as a child entertained. Um, 
my history with with the movie, and it's interesting. I, I did see. I remember vividly seeing it in the theater because I remember laughing at everything that Johnny Five said. I thought Johnny Five is. A, I just remember being completely charmed by him as okay. a kid. Again, how old would I have been? I would have been nine, eight, or nine when I saw it in the theater. And you know that was seeing with the crowd. It's a good audience movie, right? I mean, I remember mm-hmm. like everybody laughing, even the the Fisher Stevens lines. You know, people they were laughing at that. We'll obviously get into that stuff, but I, I remember vividly Johnny Five just charming the pants off me and being, and even today, like when I when we watched the movie just recently, I could quote all his lines. I mean, the, his lines are really memorable. I I, I really enjoyed that. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, that's that's what you walk away from. You walk away being charmed by the robot. Like obviously, there's the romance stuff, and we don't, as a child or as kids, we don't recognize Steve Gutenberg. We don't recognize Ali Sheedy. They're just people in this movie that we might recognize vaguely from some other thing. But again, being big into Transformers, um, Johnny Five was a, a big a, attraction for me. I mean, that's he's a robot. You know, he's talking. You know, he's he's. Um, you know, just the way that he interacts with Ali Sheedy and Steve Gutenberg, I remember just being convinced that he was alive as a kid. Number five is alive. And just like Never Ending Story, it has that magic that it works over you. And I don't know, like, adults watching it at the time, were they just charmed because kids were charmed or were they charmed because the movie was charmed? Um it's it's kind of hard to get a beat on that. But again, I can't speak for everybody else besides myself. Um, I do remember seeing Short Circuit very vividly in the theater and just laughing at everything Johnny Five said and obviously being crushed at the end when I thought he was killed. Um, I think I cried. I bet I cried because, again, the movie, even today, the movie has a power. With all the problematic bugs that are going on in the movie, the movie has a power to make you believe that Johnny Five is alive an actual character, you know, living, I don't want to say breathing, but he's like a living, you know, active character that, you know, has a life of his own. I, I don't know. So e- even today it kind of worked as magic, but you know, that was my history with it. Just being charmed by Johnny five and that that's, that magic still works today. I think that's important. Okay, good. Well, let me, let's talk about this for a second. Um, I, I noticed while watching it that um, technology in eighties movies back you know, was the way they, uh, the way they um, interpreted technology, I guess, on screen was to have like little uh, digital images and little like, you know, lasers. And and, uh, and it always looked like an 80s video game to me, like the 80s, the graphics of a, of a Super Mario Brothers or, or a, you know, Pong type video game is what I always think of when I see these graphics that are in these 80s movies that are about technology or robots or whatever. And so when I see those, I always kind of want to laugh at it because it's like, that's not <laughs> how technology worked back then. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't, it was more like MS-DOS and these, degree, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like floppy disks and stuff. It wasn't, it wasn't these like, you know, super advanced things, but even their super advanced, you know, notion of what technology would be isn't super advanced. It's like these, you know, silly, you know, uh, graphics that you'd put in like a, a arcade Atari, you know, video game or something like you know what I'm saying? Like Karate Champ or something like that. That's how it looked to me. And so, you know, I think about that. Uh, but I wanted to see what your opinion was. What did you think about how they use technology in the movie? Well, that was my first note that I took. Was always, It's always funny watching 80s computer graphics. Because I think during the time when they were, when they would show these things like in, you know, uh, War Games or even Star Wars or Tron or all these, you know, you think these high tech things. And it's funny because we look at them now and it's like, wow, that is not where the technology went at all. I, you know, it seems like back then it's very newfangled. I remember getting in, in a conversation with one of our friends, uh, Mike, and we watched even Mission Impossible. And there's a part where Ethan Hunt is, um, he's typing on, you know, the internet trying to find Job or whatever. And I remember Mike laughing going, that's not how, that's not how the internet works. You know, just how he's able to connect and, and search for things. So even in the 90s, like technology is so far improved. I also liked like the giant keyboards with the giant keys. Like if you look at keyboards now, they're very like uh, shallow. They're not deep, but like these, the keyboards that they're typing on, they're just so deep and they're so huge and they're so loud that you just can't help but kind of laugh at it. I, it's, I don't know. It's just always funny to me when people, they're trying to get a bead on technology and where it's going. Sure. It looks amazing then, but I don't think they, maybe they didn't take into account 
where electronics would go or technology would go, or maybe they just thought this is, this is the future. This, this is going to bowl people over. And so I'm sure in a theater in 1986, if we were, you know, getting into computers, I'm sure that would have blown our minds. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's just always funny watching all these movies and the, how high tech they think they're being, but they're, they're like, oh man, just even three years after showing this, I, I bet, uh, like you were saying, the MS-DOS and the, the, the Pong video graphics, technology just shot way past what we see on screen. Yeah. And um, I also wanted to mention the, the robots, the use of the robots. Um, because robots were kind of all the all the rage back then like it was like a robot every movie had a robot in it there was terminator there was you know short circuit there was i mean even rocky had like a, a robot maid that came and gave the drinks to polly and all that stuff so robots were kind of like on our mind and there's a, a tv show i thought about too i watched in this movie was that the tv show small wonder where the the little girl was a robot you know so so robots were like a big deal back then and so um, I just thought that they actually did a really good job with the robots. Like I thought um, the design was really cool. And so I see why Wally kind of, you know, stole the design because it, it was, it's a good design and, and it worked. And um, anyway, but what do you think? Do you think that the, the robots and the way the interactions with the actors on screen worked with this robot? Oh, absolutely. First of all, I, I think it's really funny. Like all the shows and the movies you just name dropped as you were think as you were saying them, I was thinking them. So you and I were, <laughs> we're simpatico there i think a lot of the robots too like transformers is obviously big but i think in movies wise they're probably inspired by c-3po um uh, you know and the terminator stuff like that it's, it's just kind of you know a trend that you kind of pick up on i thought you know my kids we watched it with the two younger boys my two older kids had seen it before and so they obviously um uh, weren't interested uh, but the younger kids they watched it and they they vibe right away that it was oh that's wally like is that wally you know because <laughs> it looks you know they they took i agree with you it looks like they is there like documentation or are there actual reports that say they took the design from johnny five i don't know if there's actually like you know official reports that that's where it came from but when i first saw wally i thought oh my gosh that's johnny five you know yeah. what i mean so it was like they had to have you know pulled some kind of you know you know uh inspiration from shorts like it yeah i mean wally the the thing the movies that people compared them to they called it r2d2 the movie and you know it's the remake of short circuit so i i i think the people at the folks at pixar they're too smart to be dumb i don't know if that makes sense so they obviously knew what they were doing i just thought that the you know, especially taking Johnny Five. You, when when the five robots are moving around, they're shooting the tanks and stuff like that. And by the way, you brought up Terminator. I thought, um, you know, the first shot of the movie uh, proper, where you see the green fields and the roses, and then the tank treads roll over it. That's a very Terminatory shot. It seems like they took it exactly from Terminator. So I thought of that. And just as a side note, I think the red and the green are the maybe the only scene or the only shot of this entire movie that I thought, oh, that looks pretty good. I think that, you know, that the color scheme, you know, is pops right there. I think that was the only time, but when the robots are doing that thing, they, they look, they look robotic, but when Johnny five gets hit by the, we call him Johnny five. He doesn't actually get hit and call himself Johnny five until the end, but I don't care. Mm -hmm. That's what we'll call him. When he gets hit by the lightning, And he starts defaulting immediately. You see a shot of his fingers on the light switch. And from that moment, I was like, this, it's very human. It's, it's human characteristics that he's doing. I know that they, you know, it was Sid Mead that helped design the robot and they tried to make everything practical. Sid Mead from, and I think he, you know, he worked on Blade Runner and, and uh, 2010 uh, stuff like that, but he helped design those robots. The design of it, they, you know, they had people op operating the, the arms and the, you know, I just thought that the eyes were very expressive. It doesn't really have a mouth, but it still works. But the way, the, I just think the design itself is ingenious. The way they have the eyebrows and the way that the eyes would move. Yeah, they should come up and look around and stuff. Yeah, it was very expressive and very, like, it, there were emotions that were, you know, when he's trying to process, you know, disassemble, dead. You know, dis, when he's doing that stuff, you know, he's, that, that's, that's human, right? And that's tough to do. I think, again, aside from the problematic stuff, 
the robotics and the design of Johnny Five is masterful. It, even then as an adult, I bought it. I don't think it's just nostalgia. I don't think it's nostalgia for me and a kid. Watching it this time and trying to watch it with fresh eyes is what we usually try to do. It still won me over. Yeah. And, it, and it kept winning me over. And I like how even his dialogue, like he kept referring himself as number five, like number five is alive. And then eventually he says, I am alive. I told me. He starts being like, I don't know, that, the whole thing with the robot, I just think that that is very masterfully done even today. I thought that was very well done. All right, cool. Well, let's, let's jump into actors. And uh, while we're on Johnny Five, let's talk about the actor who voiced Johnny Five, uh, Tim Blaney. Do you know uh, him from much else other than uh, Short Circuit? Or I don't. He... I think the story is like he was one of the puppeteers and Badham wanted to, like he was the voice like on set, he would be the voice. And he just, Badham just thought that he had a rapport with the actors. And so that's why they used the voice. He just thought it was easier than trying to pour it in some, some, a different actor. It, it just works. And I think, again, we talk about Badham as he's a good, he's, a, he's not a great director. I don't think he's ever made any movie that's been like, wow, that was like, he's an auteur, you know, he's going to be, you know, he, he's directed. So, and again, Saturday night fever, it was funny that there's a whole section of this movie <laughs> devoted <laughs> since he directed that. But you know, Blue Thunder's uh, one that I remember as a kid, the stakeouts. I really like uh, the Dreyfus Estevez chemistry. Badham is a very, I, I don't know if I'd call him, um, I don't know. I don't know if I'd call him a good director. He's just good at what he does. I don't Maybe that makes a good director. I don't know what the definition is, <laughs> but anyway, his decision to make, um, you know, Tim Blaney, the voice be the voice of Johnny five. It, it just works. I think that takes a keen mind to be able to see that and understand that that's going to communicate the, the relationships better to an audience. Um, but yeah, Tim Blaney, I don't think, unless you have more information on him, I think he was just a puppeteer and his, his voice just caught on. They just got used to him. Yeah. Um, he's known for being a voice actor. I mean, he's done stuff in men in black and, you know, SpongeBob and all kinds of other cartoons. So he's very well known in the voice actor community. Um, and I, I would say he's, he's a uh, super talented at doing that too. I think he does a good job at, uh, um, portraying those emotions just with your voice. Like that's, that's a whole other level of talent that it takes as an actor is to just use your voice to convey, convey emotions and, and to act without using any facial expressions, just use your voice. So I think he's really good at doing that. Yeah, and I think, uh, again, watching it with uh, the boys, when, you know, when he, he's on the truck and he tries to go after the butterfly or whatever and he flies off of the truck, off of the bridge, and then he has the parachute and he goes, wee! <laughs> My boys laughed at that. I mean, they, Johnny Five just worked on them. And it, it got to the point where they were laughing at everything he was doing that my first thought was, oh, the ending is going to crush them. <laughs> because they were buying into it. And again, that's no small feat. It is, I, I can't say this enough, it's no small feat to make us believe in this robot as a living being. Uh, and I think, like you said, Blaney has a lot to do with that. He humanizes that character. Um, and I guess the lightning made his voice a little bit higher and not like the, the yeah. other robots. <laughs> yeah. So. All right. Let's talk about uh, Steve Gutenberg. Cause he's a uh, kind of the draw of the movie or he was back then. Steve Gutenberg was the, that is really funny to me. I remember we're, that's those are a really funny uh, formation of words you got going there. And I think we talked about that with the Transformers episode. It's like when we saw Judd Nelson, I think I commented like, it's funny thinking of, we lived in a world once where Judd Nelson was the draw of a movie. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, Steve Gutenberg, I just, you know, he's well, three men and a baby, uh, police Academy short circuit. I'm, he was a big part of my childhood. Um, yeah. how did you think he did in this one? I thought he was all right. Um, he's basically playing kind of the same character he does in the police Academy movies. He's kind of the same, like, you know, um, cause I only thought that because G.W. Bailey is in the movie too. And so with, 
with him in the movie being kind of like the, the antagonist of Steve Gutenberg's character, it's kind of like, well, this is like Police Academy. You know, you have the same kind of like dynamic going on. And so uh, that's why I thought that. But overall, I thought he was fine. I thought he was okay. Like, it wasn't he's, special, but it wasn't, you know, terrible either. Yeah, he's a, like I said, there's nothing wrong with him. He's just like, he's one note, but that's, you know, you go to see Steve Gutenberg. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be laughing at that. <laughs> you go to see Steve, a Steve Gutenberg movie expecting a certain thing from him, and you want the Mahoney from Police Academy. Um, you know, you, and it, that's fine. I mean, he he's likable he's got a likable face there's there's nothing wrong with him it's just um yeah i mean it, it's just it's kind of sad that i don't i don't know what happened like did he just get out of favor with people or is just his vanilla acting just, yeah, just so but yeah i mean what did uh like i said i thought he was fine i i really liked the scene like i said i i think his acting and ali sheedy's acting with the robot was very believable they did a very good job you know, making us believe that they were interacting. Um, and obviously there's the movie magic of cutting tight or, or cutting before you could see like the puppeteers, things like that. I, mm. uh, I did like the scene where they kidnap him and he's trying all these tests to either prove or disprove that Johnny five is alive or just yeah. a machine. And he comes up with, you know, there's a scene where he's drinking the coffee or, and he comes up with the joke uh, where he pours the soup onto the paper and there's the leaf. I liked all that stuff. And I thought, it, it got across very well. Um, you know, his, his, uh, just, I don't know, just that scene was very well done, very well communicated. Yeah. Well, they foreshadow that with the very first part when he first escapes and they're saying, doesn't get sad, doesn't get happy, doesn't laugh at your jokes. It only, it only makes programs. Game. Right. So, so when they foreshadow that, his, his, um, thought to tell it a joke and see if it lasts a joke as proof that it's, you know, alive, that that's where that came from. So I, I kind of tied that in this time. I didn't notice that before when I was a kid that that's what they were doing. But that's why he told that joke. That's why he wanted to make sure the robot laughed at the joke. Um, but yeah, like I say, I think he's fine. Uh, let's go over Ali Sheedy real quick before we move on to Fisher Stevens. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's fine. Again, <laughs> everybody's fine. There's, there's, everybody's assigned, acts to do a job and they do their job. Steve Gutenberg does the Gutenberg thing. Ali Sheedy is kooky. And I wrote that we know that she's a good egg because she collects animals. I mean, she, you know, she <laughs> has what skunks and, and birds and, you know, parrot, you know, all, she has all, and dogs and cats and all those things. And, it, and I think that's a shorthand for just saying, oh, this is a good person. We know we can trust her because animals trust her. Yeah, and, well, you know, uh, yeah, a good person who lets her cats walk on the stove while she's cooking dinner. <laughs> you know I mean? Right. Well, I, I turned to Elizabeth and I was like, what, how, did, how does it, how do you think it smells in there? <laughs> it looks very clean, but we're not seeing any of the floor. Like, I don't <laughs> So yeah. I don't know. Again, when we're talking about Steve Gutmer, we're talking about Ali Sheedy. They're hired to do a thing, and she does. You know, she gets some good lines, and they they have very good interaction with the robot. Like I said, but there's not really anything more. You, I think you can say everybody's just hired to do a thing, and they do the thing, which is not a negative, but it's not something to really dive into. So, yeah, I, I like you. I thought she was okay. I kept noticing that she just didn't notice things that were going on, like. She'd get mad at Johnny Five for spilling the pasta or spilling the sauce, but then not clean it up. And then she'd get mad at him for, for breaking the china, but then not clean it up. <laughs> and then she, you know, he'd break when he fell over the, the deck and broke the, the decking and fell into the chicken coop or whatever. Um, it's like that kind of stuff would really get me upset. You know, <laughs> it's like, what do you think you're doing? But here's what I want to point out. She at first thought he was an alien, right? So she thinks this you know, metal you know, machine looking thing is an alien. <laughs> and then when he falls off the deck into the chicken coop, she notices from Nova Robotics and goes, you're a robot? <laughs> it's like, Just now <laughs> you notice it's a robot? <laughs> you know what I mean? So she kept doing those kind of things. And that kept bugging me that she was like, why isn't she smarter than that? You know, why isn't she like more, you know, willing to notice these things? And to, I don't know, just it like she's very educated. Well, do you think that was a consistency of character? Do you think it would have been like she was absent-minded sometimes, but then smart and noticed and very observant other times? Do you think that would have been more noticeable and more problematic? I don't know. I mean, maybe, but I, I, I did think that um, I would have liked her to be a little more, you know, just observant and just aware of what's happening with this thing that's, you know, coming to her life all of a sudden that she's, 
she's not just willing to let it wreck her house and you know what I mean it was just kind of like who is this person <laughs> you yeah. know why was she being so trusting and so willing to let what she thinks is an alien you know destroy everything and then just I don't, I don't know it was just weird to me it was weird but as far as her performance goes she sold it like you said she sold it and so in that aspect it worked right but when, well, I, when I look at the character development and then what they wrote on the page I don't think it worked that well Right. Well, I might be jumping the gun here, but it remind like I was reading an article um, uh, in the, the AV club. They did an interview with Austin Pendleton. Um, okay. What's his character's name in Short Circuit? Howard? Is that his name? Howard Marner, I think. Okay, Howard. So they did an interview with him and they were asking him about, you know, they went through his history of the films and he, he said that uh, Pendleton went to college with John Badham. And the script, um, S.S. Uh, Wilson and Brent Maddock, who also wrote Tremors, I believe, um, he was saying that the script that he read re initially was very smart, very funny. It was a wonderful script. And then he says something about how the movie kind of turned into a bland children's movie when they made it. More specifically, they asked him about um, Steve Gutenberg and Ali Sheedy, who are very, like, again... <laughs> box office draws for the time. That's just, that's really, that's really funny to say, but they, the, uh, the studio wanted them because they were a draw and Pendleton was, was in the interview. He talked about how hiring Gutenberg, hiring Sheedy, it didn't really match what was on the page. He talked about Gutenberg has this thing where he can't talk to women. You know, he, he, he talks about them like they're programs and he, he doesn't, he's, you know, an introvert and doesn't, that's part of his character arc learning to talk to to Stephanie. Um, but I, I think I kind of agree with that. Like Gutenberg is like we talked about, he's very charming. He's a charming actor. He's likable. And it doesn't, I don't know if it matches. I don't know if that likability matches the arc that he can't talk to a woman, that he's very shy around them. And he, he just doesn't know how the right words to use. I don't know if the Gutenberg face matches the character. Of, of Crosby, you know what, I mean? what, what? What would you think? I mean, first of all, am I, does that make sense? What he, what Pendleton says? Uh, maybe, but just because of what I know from the movie and being being used to it, being Steve Gutenberg, it's hard for me to see anybody else in that role. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I just think that uh, the part that I agree with is, I think Gutenberg is so likable that I don't know if I buy him as an introvert. Just, oh, okay. just the way that he's talking to Ben from that very first scene. I know he's written that way, but I don't know if it's acted. That, I don't know. I just thought in that interview, that was a very interesting idea that you don't usually think about. Yeah, it's Gutenberg and we like him, but does the Gutenbergness match the character on the page? I don't know if it does. Mm. I don't know if like Pendleton mm -hmm. says, if you got like the Dustin Hoffman character from The Graduate, if you can imagine that, would that idea of him not... Um, the arc of him not getting along with women, would that be more believable from an acting point of view? I don't know. It's just something to think about. Okay. What do you say about Ali Sheedy though? What was his, uh, you said he had something about Ali Sheedy too. What do you say about that? I think it was just uh, reading the interview. I don't, I think he mostly talked about Gutenberg. His with Sheedy, I think it was just more like, Oh, she was a pretty face that they needed. And I don't know. Sheedy is less of a problem. Like she's supposed to be kooky and absent minded. And I think she plays that well. I mean, it, um, I don't know if it's a stretch for her um, because of the other movies that we've seen her in breakfast club. You know, she's more of an introvert than that, but she's still kind of kooky. So you can see this as kind of uh, yeah. uh, like an evolution of that. Um, but he didn't really talk about from the, what I read of the interview, he didn't talk about Sheedy as much as he talked about Gutenberg. I think it was the Gutenberg thing that was easier to focus on in the interview. Okay. Real quick with Ali Sheedy. I always noticed this when I was younger watching this movie, but she has this like little tick with her jaw that when she talks or delivers a line, sometimes her jaw will hang open and she'll like shift her jaw in a certain way. Like, you know what I mean? Are you going to be okay? I don't think so. I'm not fully sure why I mean, and I see her do that uh, in other movies as well, like in Breakfast Club and uh, what's the other one that she's in? The other a Rat Pack one. There's another one that she's in, I think. Oh, there's she tons in, of them. Um, anyway. St. Elmo's Fire, these, probably she's really in that one. Yeah. yeah. But I see her, like, her jaw hang open, and she kind of, like, you know, her jaw shifts when she talks. Have you noticed that? 
Yeah, yeah, I did. That's interesting. I didn't really, now that you pointed it out, I was like, oh yeah, she does do that quite a bit. It's just one of her tics, like the bottom yeah, yeah. jaw, like it maybe it's uh, out of yeah. joint sometimes. And uh, I, I thought about that, and it made me remember when we were acting in high school and college and everything, that uh, someone told me once that I have a, a little tick that I do where I purse my lips together. And I was like, I do? <laughs> I was like, I have no idea that that's what I do. But apparently I purse my lips, like I deliver a line and then kind of like purse my lips. I don't know. I, I guess that's what I do. But I was never aware of it until it was pointed out to me. And I was like, oh, I guess I do do that. Yeah, I had that too. I remember there was one time we were rehearsing, I think we we're at the Shakespeare Festival or something like that. We had the, obviously the, the the dual scene and then we had the ensemble stuff. And I think there was one where we were rehearsing for the ensemble and one of the actors, I think it was Eric uh, Taylor, I think that was his name. He started going off on an impression of somebody and people started laughing and they, I noticed that they were looking and pointing at me. And so I thought, oh, I guess I do whatever he's doing. Um, so, uh, you know, so, we all, yeah, I think I know what it was <laughs> he was doing Okay. because I can tell you what your tick is or was anyway. Oh, please, please um, tell me what, what it is. <laughs> you had this like little shake with your head you would do. You'd like shake your head and you'd talk. Your head would like do that. You know what I'm I saying? Guess. Like you do this little thing with your head. Yeah. So that was kind of like your tick that you would do. And apparently mine's pursing my lips. So. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, all actors have their little ticks that they do. I'm sure if we really, um, uh, again, kind of off, off topic, uh, Age of Ultron was a, a, a rough movie some of the time, but James a Spader in that, he plays Ultron. There was a, being a fan of The Blacklist, and uh, my wife and I watched that. We watched Age of Ultron in the theater, and just, even though he was motion captured, there were some ticks that Ultron was doing that we just guffawed at because oh my gosh that's so james spader even in robot form you can see him doing that so uh i don't know everybody has those little ticks and uh mm -hmm. yeah it's just i think the thing with sheedy like her jaw that's that's part of the charm i don't have a i don't per se i don't have a problem with it i don't think that's what you're saying you just noticed that she did that yeah i don't have a problem with it but i did just notice it you know i've noticed it the whole time i've always yeah. noticed it with her it's just something right. that I've noticed that she does Anyway, let's move on to Fisher Stevens because I know we got a lot to say about Fisher Stevens. So let's talk about him real quick. Okay. So go ahead um, and go first. What do okay. you think about Fisher Stevens and, and this whole thing? Well, like I said about the movie itself, I, I remember, uh, I, I don't remember specifically laughing at anything that Ben said or did. I remember specifically laughing at everything Johnny Five said or did because that charmed me. Watching it this time, you know, it's, and I, I bet you anything, back then, Everything was everything was different back in the eighties. We weren't as what's the word that the kids use these days? Woke. We weren't as woke. We weren't as aware of the the issues that we were and the homophobia and the transphobia. That that stuff, those kind of jokes are all over eighties movies, especially. And I think it bled into the nineties a little bit. But especially in the eighties, you know, we talked um, when we talked about Better Off Dead, we talked about all the other um, uh, sex comedies of the time, and Better Off Dead, I think avoided that because like I talked about when the Asians, the, the Japanese guys pulled up in their car and I thought, Oh no, here we go with the, the long, the long duck dong stereotyping, but they didn't do that. They talked like Howard Cosell instead. So it disarmed you. So even mm -hmm. watching better off dead, you were, you were aware of the time of those stereotypes that were happening. I just thought watching Fisher Stevens this time that a lot of the, like he kept saying, like, um, uh, like you said at the, with the game, like I'm tired of being the one that wears the dress in this family. You know, instead of saying bingo, he says bimbo. He says, I need to go to the Jack. You know, he, that's obviously played for comedy, but the fact, I think the, the role was written for a Caucasian. And I think the Brunson Pinchot was cast at first, um, but then he was fired and then Fisher Stevens came back to play him. And so we kind of talked, touched upon this in the jazz singer episode and the silver streak episode with the black face and the brown face in this, there's just something in the eighties. It was funny because we didn't know any better. I know that sounds terrible, but all these eighties movies are loaded with this kind of problematic stuff that we didn't think was problematic back then. It was, it wasn't normalized yet. The homosexuals and the, the trans, you know, those, I, I don't know, I don't want to sound like insensitive, but it, it just wasn't normalized back then. 
Well, that's just it. Because it wasn't a thing back then, because we weren't pol politically correct or, like you said, woke, uh, because we weren't like that, uh, it wasn't a problem. People didn't see it as a problem. And so it was just funny. And uh, stereotypes are, are stereotypes because there, there's truth in there. There's a little bit of truth in, like, when an Indian comes to America and tries to learn English, he's going to get it wrong. He's not going to do it just correct, you know, like he's supposed to. And so that's why he mispronounces things and says the wrong word in times. And that's why it's funny, uh, because there is truth in that. But um, I don't think we can judge, um, you know, movies of the past by our standards of today. You know what I mean? We can't do that. We can't say, well, today we are like this. So this movie is bad because it doesn't hit our standards. You can't do that. You have to realize that for the time, that was acceptable and that was, you know, uh, considered funny and it was okay because there wasn't that political correctness going on. And I'm not a big fan of that. I don't think there really should be any of that. I think we should all just, you know, whatever, that's a whole different thing. But what I'm saying is, um, I don't think we can judge uh, what happened in the movie and what he said and what he did as that character um, as, you know, negatively because of how we are looking at things today. You know what I mean? Does that make any sense? Yeah, cancel culture is really, really big these days. Anybody does something wrong, it's just easier to cancel them out instead of maybe dealing with the problem. I know this thing with all the... the I, again, we can have a whole episode on it. These Disney live action remakes, a lot of what they're doing is to correct problems, like the outmoded ideas. And I just think, like with them, um, we want, I've, I've sworn I've, I'm done watching those remakes because I just don't have a good time watching them. The whole time I'm watching those remakes, I'm just, well, why did they change that? Or that was different? Or what, what was the point of switching that? Or how can they left that part out? It's not a fun experience for me because I'm I'm just thinking that the whole time. I can't get into the story because I'm just comparing them. I know that's my issue. A lot of people don't have that issue. My wife and I, we tried to watch the Lady and the Tramp remake on Disney Plus. And it was fine. You know, in the original cartoon, there are no black characters. You know, it's based in what the, the 40s, um, Louisiana, or, you know, where, where the South, wherever it was based in. The live action remake has black actors in the role. So um, the, the, the wife is played by a black actress. You know, she has black um, uh, family, which is, which is fine, right? I, there's nothing wrong with that. But just doing the research on that, when you went back, blacks weren't allowed to intermingle with whites back then. There was, this is before the civil rights thing. It was still like, if you were to marry inter, an interracial marriage was illegal. Like, and so it, it was just hard because then even then I was like, well, why did they, I, I, it's fine that you want to have people of color in these roles. That, that's fine. But the fact that you're doing that, you're erasing history. You're telling the kids, and I, you know, I get that's a fantasy about talking dogs, but you're erasing that whole idea that there was this, this horrible attitudes and, and back in, back in the day, you know what I mean? And so instead of talking about it, instead of showing, um, you know, hey, there are problematic issues in this movie. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about the differences between now and why a, a person talking in an Indian accent in brown face, why that's not acceptable today. But back then it was acceptable, even though it shouldn't have been. Yeah, no, I see your point. What were your thoughts on instead of, instead of erasing history just in, versus talking about the issues? Yeah, I think uh, you should let history be what it is. Like, let's don't try to change it. That's what I think. I think those who don't study history are bound to repeat it, right? So what's, what's the point of trying to erase history? If you try to erase history, then you are definitely going to repeat it. So just let history be what it is. Let the movies that were made back then live as they were and be what they were. And if you have different standards today, then that's different. You know what I mean? That's a whole other thing. But if, you know... You shouldn't, you shouldn't judge movies of the past based on what you believe today. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing with Fisher Stevens, you know, I, I rolled my eyes at it. I don't think there was, I, I did laugh at, uh, I don't know, it's not necessarily something to be ashamed of, but I did laugh at, you know, when he said, I need to go to the Jack. I did laugh when he said, uh, you know, um, you, you awarded a cake instead of, uh, you know, take the cake, stuff like that. The only thing that really bothered me, I, I don't think he was that funny a character. There's nothing more to him than just the missing of, of idioms. You know what I mean? And he, I think Aziz Ansari, he, he grew up, you know, he's, you know, seeing um, this Indian character on screen was something that he identified with. But the fact that 
it was like kind of poking fun at it. I don't think, like we talked about in Three Amigos, how a guapo, you know, and his his gang, they have talks just like we're, we get that they're caricatures. We get that even they're aware that this is not really a representation, an accurate representation of what the Mexican people are like. It's obviously a joke. Um, in this, I don't, and I get that, you know, when, when the, you know, casting a white actor and putting him in brown face because, you know, it's just popular and it, it's, it's a funny thing to do. You wouldn't do that today. You'd actually get an Indian actor to play him. But is that still racist by, it's probably less racist, but is it, you know, is it still racist to make an Indian talk like that, an Indian character talk like that? I wouldn't think so, but that's just because I have different opinions. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I wouldn't think so. Well, it, it's complicated, right? I mean, how, what, what can you do that isn't offensive these days? Um, so, uh, you know, like I said, it, it might have been, it would probably be better to hire an Indian actor than to play it, have a white actor, you know, put on makeup and play an Indian, because it fooled, it fooled people into thinking that it was an actual Indian actor. So I guess he did a good enough job. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Well, what about this? Like you said, the remakes of the Disney movies, why are they, why are they replacing Ariel with a black girl? You know what I mean? Isn't that, could that be considered racist? I don't, you know what I mean? Why? Yeah. Uh, I was in a conversation with somebody on Twitter this week about how Ra's al Ghul and Batman Begins. It was racist that they cast a, um, like an Arabic character. They cast Liam Neeson as an Arabic character. And my first thought with that was, it's not trying to sound like a snob. I, I sound like a snob. I know if, when I say this, there are going to be comic book bands that are going to want to cancel me. But comic books are not real life. <laughs> like when you, you, you know, he's Arab in the comics, a movie is a different thing. As long as they don't make an issue of, it's not like you do a movie about Malcolm X and you cast a white actor as Malcolm X that's that's different does that make sense but then i talked about you know in the birds of prey movie the black canary character she's white and blonde in the comics but it's uh journey smollett i think is her name in the movie she's a black character i don't have a problem with that you know that's not a big deal um lawrence fishburne is perry white in man of steel batman versus superman i don't have a problem with that what whatever cast the black actor but it's if you're going, I think it's just the consistency. If you're going to be upset about Liam Neeson cast as an Arab character, be upset that they cast a black actress as a white character from the comics. You know, there's, there's a double standard going on here. And I get it. Like, we're white guys. You know, we have the privilege of not having to face that kind of prejudice. So it's different. But why nitpick one racial switch and not nitpick another? Yeah, it has to go both ways. Right. Can't be a hypocrite. But you get so what I'm saying. Yeah, it's fine. You get what I'm <laughs> saying, though. It's a little more sensitive when you, you know, cast a, a white guy as an Indian person. When you cast a black, a white character and put him in blackface, there's, there's obviously a tinge of ickiness to that, of, of cringe. Mm -hmm. Again, as the kids say, there, there is because those people are already, you know judged and already had they're facing that prejudice so why give them additional i don't i don't know it's this is a very complicated subject and it, it's uncomfortable to talk about but you know it needs to be talked about well i i have different views i i think it's fine i think wh why can't a white guy play a black guy why can't a, like you said why can't a black guy play a, a, you know, a white character i have no problem with like you know robert denny jr playing a black guy in tropic thunder i have no problem with uh you know Gene Hackman or Gene Wilder putting on blackface in, in uh, Silver Street doesn't bother me. <laughs> None of that stuff really bothers me. So it's kind of like, I don't see people get so upset about it. You know, it's just don't get offended. That's how you solve it. Don't get offended. <laughs> just appreciate it for what it is. You know, if it's supposed to be funny, let it be funny. If it's supposed to, they're not trying to be racist on purpose. I don't think they're out there trying to be racist. That's what I don't, that's what I think. I think they're just telling a story and if it requires, you know, some switching of, of, uh, race or whatever then let it you know, who cares you know what i mean just like i say don't get offended by it and try to enjoy it for what it is yeah and i think with the fisher steve i just don't think he's that funny a character you know you get that that's his tick after a while but that's all that it is you know and he's he's a likable guy he's friendly you know he's he's friends with crosby and all that stuff i just 
I noticed that the camera would linger on him and let him like finish a thought. And then the thought wasn't that funny. Like it was like, why are we giving this guy so much attention? It's, it's not the fact that he's an, whether he, he was a white character having the same problem, whether he was just had a lower IQ as a white person, it would have had the same effect on me. I would have been like, this, this character is not that funny. I don't understand why we're spending so much. And a part of that is the fact that he's an Indian and he's got an Indian accent in this. That's, Back then in 86, that was probably a big draw for people. That made a lot of people laugh because that's just the attitude of it. As terrible as that is to say, that's just the attitude of the time. And it's something that we had in the past that we need to, we need to be aware of those issues to be able to move past it and to be able to live our lives and just put all that past us and just treat each other like human beings. I don't know. We're, we're getting way, way too deep into it, but you know, you get what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, like I, I do think we're fully aware of it. And I think, like you say, we, I think we are past it, honestly. I, th- I think we keep rehashing it and that's the problem. We've already moved past it several times in, in, you know, our history. Yeah. Just get over it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just move on. I honestly don't, I have plenty of friends of different races and I don't see them as a different race. I see them as my friend. You know what I'm saying? That's how I look at them. That's how I think of them. And so when I see these kind of characters on, t- on in movies and stuff, it doesn't bother me one bit. Like I, in fact, I was going to mention when I was younger watching uh, Short Circuit, I didn't get most of uh, Fisher Stevens' characters' lines as jokes. I didn't laugh at those things, like you said. I laughed more at the Johnny Five stuff. But this time watching it, I, I was able to kind of like laugh at it and enjoy it more. Um, and I honestly didn't really think it was offensive, but that's just me. Okay. Like I said, everybody's going to have a different opinion. It's just, it's something that should be talked about, I think, instead of just swept under. So at least there's a conversation going that there were, if they were to make short circuit today, they wouldn't cast a white person to do that. It would be different. Right. Right. So I agree with that. Yeah. So, yeah. A right. um, couple things that I didn't point out is um, the, uh, something I noticed was the Nova robotics logo was okay. the uh, Vitruvian man, da, Vin- da Vinci's Vitruvian man. And so for the episode, I, I went ahead and wore my Vitruvian man t-shirt. It's a drummer though. See, it's a drummer. Of course. So, uh, <laughs> so I had to make sure I wear that for the episode. Right. Okay. Um, well, if we're going to go over, you know, some of the things that I've got in my notes here, um, obviously seeing David Shire's name pop up was interesting because he did the music for Return to Oz, did the music for The Conversation, All the Presidents, Man, that kind of thing. Um, we talked about G.W. Bailey, um, or as I like to call him, the patron saint of 80s douchebags. You know, being in this movie, being in Police Academy, being in Mannequin and playing that part. You know, William Atherton did that. Ghostbusters, Die Hard. Uh, You had all these different. um, uh, Larry Miller, I think, did that with Necessary Roughness. Just, you know, that's a that's a very typical role. And, you know, it's that's a lot of narrative shortcutting when you can cast a G.W. Bailey and just know that, oh, we don't need to do any work with this character because we know exactly how he's going to turn out, what he's going to be like. Let's see, what else did I have? I did also notice that uh, G.W. Bailey had the uh, the Proctor character next to him. He always had the guy holding the umbrella. He had the guy that was like, you know, yeah. his right-hand man character. So he had that. Same kind of like dynamic they have in those police movies. Right, so, right. Uh, also, I also want to mention this because I, I wrote this down about Austin Pendleton. Um, one of my favorite things he's ever done is the, the lawyer, the stuttering lawyer in My Cousin Vinny. Mm. I think he was just hilarious in that role. And so whenever I see him, I always get thrown back to my cousin Vinny and uh, <laughs> just start to giggle. Cause I know it's so funny the way he does those, <laughs> those, uh, uh, courtroom speeches where he stutters through the lines. It's pretty funny. Well, I thought he was charming in this. His character was, was, he wasn't a threat. Like he was likable. Like he was like <laughs> really like emotional and like got really dramatic. Some of the parts that made me laugh. I like when, uh, Crosby's their, uh, hobnobbing or whatever. And, and <laughs> he kind of punches Crosby in the chest and Gutenberg's like, I like how he kept saying like stat or I like the part where he's waiting in the truck when he and Ben or Crosby and Ben are trying to to go out and find Johnny five again. And he holds the gun at him. He's like, you're bluffing, aren't you? He's like, yeah, I'm bluffing. And you know, he's just, you know, a likable, there wasn't any, you know, he's just a likable fun character. I like that a lot. Um, The only other thing I I talked about um, briefly, my kids really getting into it and, you know, Spencer, he, he really gets into these movies that he's the most like me, I think, watching movies. And the part where 
you know, the the arm the the military is about to capture Johnny Five, and you know they 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 get Stephanie and they get Crosby and they're pulling him away, you know, as they're trying to explain that he's alive, and Johnny Five tears out of the back of the van, and Spencer was on his feet like cheering for Johnny Five to get away, and then the helicopters came, and I just again, when the helicopter finally blows him up, he Spencer sat, he just sank in his chair and just like he gave like he was mad, and then the scene went on, he was like. I punch all those guys in the face. Like he got, like he got really upset. And I saw that coming because again, the movie does a really good job of making us believe that Johnny five is alive. And again, he was up off his chair when, when Crosby and Stephanie are driving away. And then all of a sudden Johnny said, that sounds like a good idea. And he pops up and he jumped off his chair again and was, and was happy because, you know, I don't know. So that's, that's just the big thing. I think it works beautifully on kids it worked beautifully on me as a kid it worked beautifully on my kids today that that part at least was was timeless i think yeah okay well let's go over uh, what we think about this real quick kind of wrap it up okay. um i'll go first um like i mentioned before my opinion was influenced by my family like they kind of convinced me to like this movie as a as a young kid and i will generally say that i did like it and for a long time it was my favorite movie but um watching as an adult, I had a hard time with it this time. I, I still enjoyed it, but I had a hard time with it. However, I will still say it's worth remembering because of what it did. I think it created some, you know, Johnny Five is an iconic character. I think there's some really memorable lines in the movie, you know, uh, well above average and the whole stat thing. All that stuff is stuff that I still quote today. And um, I, I love the design of the robot and I, I still really enjoy the movie overall, even though I see all the flaws, you know, with my adult mind, I guess. Um, so I will say it's worth remembering. Okay. Um, I think I'd agree with you. It's worth remembering for the stuff that's worth remembering. I don't know if that makes any sense. Um, the, the first thing I want to say about John Badham, like we talked about being, I think he's a fine director, but watching, there's a part where the military, again, there, that's one of the times they're trying to capture Johnny five. I think it's the first time where they shoot him and he kind of shuts down. Um, before Ben and the other guy take him away. But there's a shot of Johnny Five shooting at the guys with his laser and it's like on a dock and you see there's explosions and the guys like dive out of the way. I don't think Badham's an expressive director. There's no, there's not a lot of art um, to his direction. It just, it gets the basic information across. Oh, there's a laser, the guys jumped out of the way. There's no art to it. There doesn't need to be art, but it just, gets the basic information across to you. So the movie I thought the look of it was very 80s. This is a very, very 80s movie. The way that, uh, you know, it's shot, it's, it's oversaturated with color. The, the part where Stephanie finds Johnny Five in the van, where's that blinding red light coming from in the first place, right? It's just, everything's yeah. overcranked. Everything's cut and scored to music, like a music video. Um, and there's, pop songs that run through, you know, DeBarge, you know, who's Johnny, that, that runs through the whole movie. It, so it's very 80s. I, I think it's interesting. Some of the 80s movies are 80s movies. Like Top Gun, I think, would be an ultimate 80s movie because that represents, you know, the star vehicle. It represents the soundtracks. It represents the, like, the flashy editing, the music video MTV type editing. So it stands as an 80s movie. But there are other movies like Raging Bull or... Um, uh, the, the Elephant Man we talked we've talked about before. Uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? You know, there's a RoboCop. I could I I could name you know Field of Dreams. I could name off a bunch of movies. Uh, Amadeus is another one that aren't that were made in the '80s, but that transcended their decade. If that makes any sense. Yeah. They don't feel like '80s movies or in a time capsule. They they're ahead of their time. They can last. We can watch them today. And teen comedies, even Breakfast Club, Back to the Future. Those are two of the ones better off dead that can have an impact today and can play just as well today as they did back in the eighties short circuit is a very eighties movie. Just the attitudes that it has, especially with the Ben character, you can cut all the Ben stuff out. That's, but again, like we talked about, it's good that that's there. As soon as the movie was over, we turned it off and we turned to our kids and we said, okay, so the Indian character, do you know anybody that talks like that? And our boy said, no, we don't. It's like, if you heard somebody talk like that, would you laugh at them in real life? And they automatically said, no, we wouldn't. And so we talked about how it was just back then people thought that was funny, right? And so it is worth at least having these conversations about these problematic issues that pop up in these movies. Don't just cancel them because there is 
other worthwhile stuff in this. I like we mentioned before, the Johnny Five stuff and the design of the robots is brilliantly crafted. I think, and maybe that's what Pendleton was talking about about this 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 the seeds of the script and everything that's brilliant about it. I think is still there if you're looking for it. Just the scenes and the way they try to get across what it is to be human. That's all there and it's noticeable and I think that's brilliant. And that's why I would say it's worth remembering. It does have those problematic things, but everything else that works about it still works today. I think that's, that shouldn't be discounted. All right, sounds good. Well, uh, let's come back and we'll do like a, a top three of our, our list of actors who were, were really well known back then, but not so much today. So okay. uh, when we come back, we'll go ahead and give them our little top three actors list. So, okay. Uh, we'll be right back. Sounds good. I got it. Oh, I got it. All right, this is it. Now listen close. There's a priest, a minister, and a rabbi. They're out playing golf, and they're trying to decide how much to give to charity. So the priest says, well, we'll draw a circle on the ground. We'll throw the money way up in the air, and whatever lands inside the circle, we give to charity. The minister says, no, we'll draw a circle on the ground. We'll throw the money way up in the air, and whatever lands outside the circle, that's what we give to charity. The rabbi says, no, 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 we'll throw the money way up in the air. And whatever God wants, he keeps. Mm. Oh, I get it. <laughs> All right, welcome back. So let's do our top three list of actors who we were really fond of or were really well known and kind of had a career for them a long time ago, but not so much today. Um, so well, why are we, the reason we're doing that is because Steven, not Steve, Steven, Steve Gutenberg, right? We talked about him being a draw back then. Like him in police Academy was a big thing and him showing up in short circuit. And it's just weird that he's no longer in our good graces. He's kind of, I think he did. It takes two with the Olsen twins <laughs> and he kind of faded into nothingness. And so, mm-hmm. It's, it's weird, um, especially today, the, the day of the star is kind of gone. It's, it's non-existent anymore. It's the brand now. It's the you know, superheroes. It's the Mission Impossibles. That's what gets it's us the, in the theaters. It's the ensemble, too. That you want a big ensemble of you know, famous actors to, that yeah. also kind of is awesome. Yeah, and so that's why we, you and I, we kind of decided, we always try to figure out what topic can we talk about to kind of get us out, like to outro us. And I thought that was a good topic, just people that we once loved but have disappeared for whatever reason. So what was your first one? Yeah, first pick uh, will be Rick Moranis. And, um, you know, he was really well known back then, Parenthood and uh, Kids and uh, Ghostbusters. Um, I was never really a big fan of his, but I did notice that he was in everything. And then all of a sudden he wasn't. And the reason for him to kind of disappearing was because his, I think his wife passed away or something. Okay. And so he, he kind of took time off to raise his kids. At least that's the story I heard. I'm not sure if that's accurate or not, but that's what I heard. Well, I know, I know he retired a little bit. Like he obviously had enough of the spotlight. And I think when they were trying to do the uh, Ghostbusters remake that we talked about in the very first episode, he was like, why would I want to come back for that? Like, why do I need to come back and, and just relive those things? I know that he's had that resurgence. Like he showed up in a Ryan Reynolds ad and then he was walking on the streets in New York just within the last month or so. And he got attacked by somebody. Um, but But yeah, I mean, that's... What were some of the movies that you, you other movies, that, or I think you mentioned them, but what was a particular movie that you liked Rick Moranis in? Um, well, Ghostbusters. Um, I thought he was good in parent, Parenthood. I thought he was good in that. Um, he's, also, he's also good in My Little Heaven. I think he's great in that movie. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, he was someone that I wasn't really a huge fan of, but he was in everything. And so I always noticed him and I always thought, you know, when he disappeared, I was like, oh, where'd that guy go? Why is he suddenly not around anymore? Yeah. Well, he's a good character actor. Strange Brew is another one. Bob and Doug, uh, really big. He could be versatile too. He played like a, a punk in Streets of Fire, like a bad guy. So he, he can do that stuff. But yeah, Rick Moranis is, is somebody that I liked a lot. My first one, talking about Fisher Stevens, uh, Mel Gibson, I think. I miss the, the, the pre-racist, pre-homophobic <laughs> Mel Gibson, like Lethal Weapon and Maverick where, and The Road Warrior and Year of Livering Dangerously where he was just a force to be reckoned with on screen and a face that everybody loved. And, and he had an energy and a funniness. And, you know, with Fisher Stevens too, I, I get, you know, he's fallen out of favor and he's obviously not, he's got some issues 
obviously. And I, I just saw a clip of he and Danny Glover, like at a, a tribute to Richard Donner. And they had a really good rapport together. It was just like watching Riggs and Murtaugh. And then there was just a moment where like, oh yeah, he's a, he's a racist. Like he's a bigot. Like, so that kind of stuff has tainted him. Um, and that's hard. I mean, you know, we, we love Kevin Spacey. We love like, you know, Brian Singer's movies. We love like all these, all these people that have come out as being problematic. It's like, how do you separate the art from the artist? Um, especially when you're so in everybody's face, like Mel Gibson has been in the last little bit. Um, but yeah, I, I miss, I wish we could separate that a little bit more. I miss that going back and having Mel Gibson be a draw to a movie instead of a problem. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my number two is Tom Selleck. And um, again, like Rick Moranis, I, I wasn't a huge fan, but there are some movies that he's been in that I really liked. Like, uh, uh, there's that movie, Her Alibi. I thought he was great in that. Um, wasn't a huge Magnum P.I. fan, but you know, I did watch an episode here and there and I thought he was good as that character. Um, but again, he's just kind of gone. I mean, I've seen him in reverse mortgage commercials, but I haven't seen him in anything else. So he was, he was big back then and he had the look and he had the, you know, the iconic mustache and everything. But uh, now he's just gone. Yeah. I don't know if he was ever like a huge like movie star. I know he was big on TV. Um, Quigley Down Under, I like him in that one a lot. Mm -hmm. He has a good movie star quality. And just whenever I, you know, with, he shows up with the mustache and I just, I want to hug the guy. I was like, I bet he'd be really good at giving hugs. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it's uh, he, and I think he was on Blue Bloods, the TV series that I don't know if that's still going. But he's he's not as front and center as we uh, as we remember. My second person, and we don't I don't want to rehash old wounds, but Meg Ryan I miss a lot. Um, you know she was the the everybody's pixie dream girl. Uh, you know in, in French Kiss and um, Sleepless in Seattle and You've Got Mail and um, you know all these movies that she was just a, a joy to see her in. Joe versus the Volcano was another yeah, one. That's really nice when I see. And she had that again weird weird ho Hollywood kind of. Um, hypocrisy where she made that movie with Russell Crowe proof of life and had an affair with him. And I think that broke her career because everybody saw her as the all American, you know, pure, um, you know, good girl and seeing her do that, it kind of broke that fantasy, um, which like I said, is weird because I think the reports that Dennis Quaid, her husband at the time, he had cheated on her before that, but he didn't get the same stigma. It's just the, the fact that she did. There's just a weird, you know, there's an inconsistency with the attitudes people have in Hollywood. And then obviously there's, this, you know, plastic surgery and stuff where she doesn't look the same as she used to. But I miss those times when, you know, you could walk in and be charmed by Meg Ryan. They just don't give her those opportunities anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I miss her too, actually. Uh, my third pick is Lou Diamond Phillips. And um, I only thought about that because... Um, he was a big part of my life in the 80s and early 90s with, uh, you know, La Bamba and then Young Guns and Young Guns 2 and everything and, and uh, Stand and Deliver. I thought he was good in that movie as well. Um, and I know he's done some stuff. I don't really know uh, too much about what he's done recently, but I just kind of miss seeing him play these kind of roles like Chavez or like, you know, the, the smart math genius in that movie. But um, so, yeah, that's why I picked him because, you know, he was prevalent and now he's not. Yeah. He's, he's on Twitter a lot. He's got a presence. He's still out there. He's just not as, like I said, front and center as we'd like him to be. My final one is, um, and again, he's in the limelight, Arnold Schwarzenegger. I thought as I grew up with him, you know, seeing he was a name, like you would go see movies, Arnold Schwarzenegger. And so you go see kindergarten cop with him. We went to go see junior because Schwarzenegger was in him. I think the thing with Schwarzenegger is he is not, I don't want to say he's not a good actor. He's a limited actor. He's got a limited range. And the thing with Schwarzenegger, I think he was very shrewd and very smart about how he was perceived. And so he would seek projects that would fit him like Terminator or last action hero, or you know, even jingle all the way, you know, true lies. You know, there was a time where he was just the, the box office King, but he would pursue roles that didn't push him. Like it didn't require him to go, you know, above and beyond what was, what he could do. It's like Keanu Reeves, you talk about, he's not a versatile actor, but he's a good actor. I don't know if that, that makes sense. You can watch him in the matrix and John wick and Bill and Ted, and he's likable. But what happens when he shows up in much ado about nothing? 
that's what I was going to say. I think, I think uh, Keanu Reeves is a good actor when he's in the right role. Like uh, Dracula, Bram Stoker's Dracula, Much Ado, <laughs> and Walk in the Clouds. These are movies that he's just terrible in. Like just so bad. It's just, it's, it's painful to watch. But like you say, Matrix, he does, he does, he does really well. You yeah. know, and John Wick. I like him in John Wick. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's a good actor when he has the right, the right role. Right. And it's the same thing with Schwarzenegger. I think it's just different now that, you know, you saw him start fading away to like the sixth day and end of days. Then he became a governor of California. And, you know, it's just that day of Schwarzenegger and Stallone <clears throat> and uh, Bruce Willis. That, that day has passed. Like they had their time. And it's just, I think he knows where he is. And even in the terrible Terminator sequels that he, they keep cranking out, Schwarzenegger is consistently the best thing uh, Linda, ha Linda Hamilton was good in the last one, but he's consistently the best thing about those movies because he knows what he's doing. He knows what he's there for and he delivers on that. Um, and it's just, you know, he can still maybe find his way back, but Schwarzenegger is no longer a thing. And I, I do kind of miss going to see these big non-superhero blockbusters with him in it. So are you saying that you didn't latch on to The Rock? It was basically his replacement. <laughs> well, I think The Rock is a very charismatic actor. But again, I don't think he's as big a draw either. It's, it's just unless you're a superhero and you got a cape on um, or you're Tom Cruise running like everywhere <laughs> and, you know, diving <laughs> off onto planes and stuff like that or off of planes, it's not really going to, it's not a guarantee, especially in COVID times, that you're going to make it big at the box office. So I don't know. It's just... It's a different time, and it's it's kind of sad that we're seeing all these actors that we like not be in the limelight as much as we remember them. Yeah. Yep, I miss them. All right, so uh, just so you know, uh, Darren, you and I, we don't tell each other what the next movie's going to be, right? Nope. Like, yeah, so we have no idea. The reveal of the next episode, it's just a surprise to us that it is for our listeners slash watchers. So, so uh, go ahead and tell me what the next episode's going to be. Okay, well... I, I thought about doing another break with from tradition. We did a, a, a few episodes back. We did a shorter episode with what we call a nostalgia bite on big. And we kind of wanted to do, instead of going into the hour and a half conversation that we usually have, we just want to take a few points of a movie that we flat out enjoy. And this kind of ties in with our, the point of our show, but it also doesn't. There is a TV show that's playing, that's streaming now. It started on YouTube red and then it got picked up by Netflix. It's Cobra Kai. Um, the Josh Hurwitz and uh, Hayden Schlossberg who worked on the Harold and Kumar movies and I think the American Reunion movies, they're spearheading this kind of updating slash sequel slash reboot of The Karate Kid, which again was a movie that was big from our childhoods. And just watching the show, it took me a while to get onto it, but I am amazed by this show and how it tweaks expectations, how it twists what we think is going to happen, how it kind of shifts the focus and, and deepens a, a series of movies that I don't, I don't think is as deep as we choose to remember them. I am just fascinated and in love with this show, with William Zadka, with Ralph Macho, with all the ways that it tweaks our memories of this movie. And so ha have, you, have you seen it? Have you watched it? Yeah, I watched the first couple seasons, yeah. Okay, okay, good. I was worried that you hadn't watched it, so I, was, I was, had a, ser a, a number of episodes that are going to have you watch, but since you're familiar with it, we can just talk for a little bit about how I, I just think it's one of the best things streaming right now. It's just so fun, and it's so smart, and it's so heartfelt that I, I just I want to talk about it. And so let's do Cobra Kai for next time. Okay, sounds good. It's so funny you picked Cobra Kai because – I was actually thinking about picking Karate Kid for nine, my next pick. Like, honestly, I was. I was picking Karate Kid. But uh, now I can't do that, but that's okay. Um, also, um, our last attempt in a nostalgia bite really wasn't a nostalgia bite. It was more of a nostalgia appetizer. So maybe we, this time we're going to keep it down, you know, to like maybe 10 minutes. <laughs> We'll try. We'll, we'll try. We'll, and keep we'll try. Mm -hmm. I, again, this what we want to talk about is something I might not be able to keep my mouth shut about. I might have to try and you might have to just shut me up. But yeah, let's. Uh, Maybe it'll be a nostalgia entree then. <laughs> <laughs> something, something. Well, again, it's just something we're not trying to analyze too much as far as just talking about why we think it's good. But again, let's talk Cobra Kai next time. I'm really excited to do that. All right, sounds good. For Nostalgia Cast, I am Johnny Craddock. And I'm Darren Lundberg. And we'll see you next time. Bye, guys. <laughs>